is not curable. Viruses and, and plants is, are not curable. So if you have a rose or any other plant that is usually not have variegated foliage, if you have variegated foliage, that's not a good thing. And then we start looking for whether that variegated foliage in roses is caused by a virus. In this case, back in the 70s, rose mosaic virus got into the chain of commerce and roses started coming out with scraggly, lacy designs in the leaves and people thought that was really cute until about three years later and the plant died. So we know that virus and variegated foliage go together and those things are not good when it comes to roses. So when I talk to people that are in the know about rose, rosette disease, I'm like, why is this so difficult? Why is this such a problem and it's just kind of going all over the country? And, it's, and the explanation I give is real simple and it makes a lot of sense. It's time. It's so tiny, it's almost, only one person has ever been successful in being able to look at it under a microscope. Mm -hmm. One person in the world has been able to find it under a microscope. We see the damage it does. We can do diagnostic testing and prove that it's there, but nobody can really put their finger on it and see it. And that man drew that design down in the bottom right corner of what he saw in his microscope. So they're small and they're simple. And because they're small and simple, they're hard to control. They get inside the cells that they invade. And like cancer in humans can be, if you treat the problem, you do damage to the good cells. And so that's why viruses and plants are hard to control. And we don't, we don't do it now because if we do give a product that would kill or could kill, it's going to hurt the plant and the work. So the, the best practice recommendation now is if you have a virus in a rose, preventing it and eliminating it is the, is the, is the best practice recommendation because curing it is not possible right now. How do plants get rose rosette? or viruses. They're usually, they usually come with the plant. It can be infected when you get it. It can come by insects. It can come by seed. It can come by root grass. What's so, root where plants are planted so close together that the roots oh. touch. Oh. And when the, when, the, when the virus gets to the roots, it just passes onto the healthy plant next door because the root systems are interwoven. Now, most guys, if you read about Rose Rosette, it's going to say it happens in the spring. That ain't true for Houston. It's not true for Dax. When it gets hotter than hell here, that's when these things show up. And, and the explanation is, viruses tend to take advantage of plants that are under stress. When it's 100, plants are under stress. And so they will start showing the symptoms of viral diseases down here when it's hot as opposed to in the spring when things start growing. So I'm not looking for it now. I'm looking for it May, June, July. Now, a bit about rose rosette disease. People tell me, well, is it RRD or is it RRV? The answer is the disease is rose rosette disease, RRD. It's caused by a virus, rose rosette virus, RRV. So the virus, the V is the cause, and the disease is the V. It, it, we first knew about it beginning in 1941. It was called witch's broom. It was, it was found up north. In Texas, it didn't show up until the 1990s. It took a long time to get here. Now, only affects roses, and it only affects roses in the United States. One of our research team members on the Rose Rosette Task Force described it this way. He said, we have the perfect storm in the United States. We got the disease, and we got the bug that carries the disease. That bug doesn't live anywhere but here. So that's why Rose Rosette disease is only found here. It's always lethal, and it's contagious. 
Uh, once a plant gets infected with the virus, the virus spreads to the plant from top to bottom and will eventually get down in the root system and it happens at a cellular level. What you see as symptoms is the end result. It's there for a long time hiding out, doing its virus thing before it wakes up and says, hey, I'm here. Look at what I did. So, in Texas and in the southern part of the United States, it has killed hundreds of thousands of plants. Uh, now, there's something I have been asking our team for a long time. It's not the first time we had gross rosette disease in Texas. It first showed up here in 1990. It was here for a couple of years, and then we didn't have it again until 2005-ish. And I said, why is it different? Why is what we experienced before not happening now? It's not like the truck comes from California with the plants and gets to Dallas and makes a left turn and goes to Ohio. The same plants that go to Dallas come to Texas to come to Houston. So why is Houston not having the same experience with Rose Rosette as the cities up north are? And we've worked a long time on that question, three years, that we've been looking at why, why is Gay's question not answered? And what is the answer? Let me share with you part of the answer. This is Mark Shanley on the left. He owned Shanley's Rose Nursery in Tyler. In the 1990s, rose growers created new roses by hand cutting mare stem pieces off a plant in Lurdina. <clears throat> by doing that by hand, they actually looked at the plant before they ever cut on it. And if anything was weird, they didn't cut on it. And usually they either quarantined the plant or destroyed the plant if there was a question about what was wrong with it. So plants did not get into commerce back then like they did now. Today, on the right, is a cute little machine that just travels down the rows in the greenhouses and it cuts the top two inches out of the plants and all those little pieces go in that silver hopper deal on the bottom and I've seen that silver hopper deal with about 10,000 pieces in it and a piece of rose rosette and I said do you know what that is yes ma'am that's rose rosette I said what plant did it come out of out of these 750,000 in this greenhouse? Well, we don't know. I said, what do you do with it? We just throw it away. I said, what, well, wait, because it's going to come back. And that's the difference because now nobody's looking until the cuttings are already taken. And so we don't know in the chain of commerce where that plant might have come from. So we can get rid of it. Now, Another thing that's different between the 1990s and now is what happened when Rose Rosette was found in fields. In the 1990s, the uh, Texas Rose Research Foundation and the, the Ag Cooperative burned every field that had Rose Rosette plants in it. And that had a decimating back, uh, effect on the rose industry in Texas. A lot of people didn't recover from that. Uh, but it worked. We didn't have no more rose rosette for a long, long time. Now, when plants are found in fields, there is selective destruction. If a plant tests positive, they pull it out, they get rid of it. But in some cases, adjacent plants can come down with rose rosette for as much as a year later. So those are the two things that are different from what happened before to what happened now. And probably has some contributing factor to why we're seeing rose rosette in the kind of numbers we're seeing it across a wider geographic region. Now, I don't tell, can't tell you how many times people tell me this. Knockout is not the problem. That, that's not unique to the Houston Rose Society. I hear that all across the United States. Knockout is not the problem. Uh, knockout existed 50 years before we had Rose Rosette in Texas. Uh, it is no more susceptible, and, and there have been a lot of studies about it, to Rose Rosette than any other rose. What's different about Knockout is T 
Tens of millions more plants are planted in the United States than any other growers in commerce. And so just the mathematics of that means we're going to find it in knockouts simply because there's so many more knockouts than any other name called the bars. So that's, that's why you see it. And I heard Randy Lemon say this, and I called him on the phone. We had a long chat about knockout causing rose rosette. It doesn't. He also subscribed to the theory that multiflora was in rose rosette. Multiflora is a host of rose rosette. I have talked to the man that created knockout. There is no multiflora in rose rosette. So if you hear that, disregard it, because none of that is true. Now, what is true is it looks like a whole lot of other stuff that's out there. But all the other stuff is terrible. So don't run out of here and start going looking at plants and start ripping them out because you think you might have something. Since January 1st, I have made 11 house calls of people that swore to me they had rose rosette. Not a one of them had rose rosette. They had a lot of other stuff, but not a one of them had rose rosette. So let's be smart before we do anything. Generally, down here, rose rosette is misdiagnosed and should have been diagnosed with chili flakes because we have that and that's curable and that's controllable but chili flakes causes a lot of symptoms just like rose rosette does and so I made you a handout and it tells there's two tables it's symptoms what those symptoms can look like in other caused by other things and then what those symptoms look like when they're caused by rose rosette so that might help you but be, be aware that there's lots of stuff that causes the same symptoms that Rose Rosette does. So we need to make sure that's what we have before we start doing things. Just since 2005, this map was created. There is a bigger map that goes back to the 1980s. That is real scary, so I chose not to use it. But these are places that have had confirmed diagnosis of Rose Rosette. Um, in different landscape settings. Now, in Texas, because we only concerned about you, most of the sightings until recently have been north of I-20, that right line. If it was north, of, if it was I-20 or north of I-20, you found Rose Rosette, if it was below I-20, you didn't. So that's my question to the research team about what's so special about I-20. Dallas and Fort Worth is the epicenter of Rose Rosette. There's no nursery in, in Dallas, Dallas, Fort Worth area that sells rose bush. People actually come down here to the Arbor Gate for diagnosis because they can't get them up there. Now, that's safe. Up until 2016, there were only two cases of rose rosette in Harris County in the current time period. Both of those were in plants that were brought in from the Dallas, Fort Worth area. So I wasn't ever really concerned about it getting established here because those plants were important to us, probably said. But now it's a different story. Uh, we have a number of confirmed sightings in Harris County. The first one was an apartment complex over around Chimney Rock. The next one was a fire station within a mile of the house on Chimney Rock. Uh, a intersection off of Chimney Rock where there was just the plants planted and then Memorial City and the Gallery. 77024 and 77056. Uh, this is, I believe, where it started. Uh, because that seems to be the epicenter of, in geographically of, of the disease. The homeowner at this home, no one on her street or the street behind her or the street in front of her had brought in a rose plant in the last two years. So <clears throat> I, I think this is where it started. So though if you live in or around those zip codes, you be especially careful about your plants and making sure you, you look at them closely. That's the Cheesecake Factory at the Galleria. There is three or four. Rose Rosette plants here in the front. 
right where you drop your car off in the valley. Uh, the part of my complex that had one bush that was in pain. Just one. And when it was brought to their attention that bush was sick, they went in with electric cage clippers and knocked off all the sick looking stuff on that plane and then took a leaf blower and blew it all up in a big old pile. And then the next month, the resident, who was a member of our society, called and said, oh, there's more plants. And I went, sure enough, there's more plants. Within six months, 150 rose bushes had rose rosette disease. Because when he would bring it to their attention, they would just get out the electric cage clippers and cut the suspect stuff off and blow it in a pile and just blow the problem to the next healthy plant. Now they're all caught. They believe us now. Memorial City Mall, this is right up there. When you turn into the mall parking lot, uh, the fire station over off of Dolores, the plants did not exhibit the witch's broom, but they did end up excessively thorny and then ultimately develop the witch's broom. Now, uh, where's my pictures? Have those been removed now that we're going there for the show? Uh, I don't know. They were not, they were not, they were there when I was there in September of last year. Okay, there was a picture. I don't know what happened to the picture. Okay. <clears throat> Hit your button again. Huh? Hit your button again. Maybe it's in the... No. Ah, there it is. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> part of the problem with knowing whether we have rose rosette or not is in the diagnostic ability of scientists to determine if a plant is really sick or not. If you don't take a specimen from the exact place that has the virus, the plant's not going to test positive. Now, if you've got a plant that's six foot wide and six foot tall, that's almost impossible to figure out sometimes. So our Rose Rosette Task Force has been looking at different methods of diagnostic identification because if you're a public garden and you've got 10,000 plant rose bushes, you don't want to have to wait six weeks for the results. You need to know facts. So part of our focus, or part of our team's focus has been figure out how we can improve the diagnostic ability to give more reliability with quicker results. And we're actually working on a, a test that can be done actually in the field that should be somewhere between 80 and 90 percent reliable. But this is the coolest thing. I'm going to share with you some new stuff. Okay, <clears throat> there's lots of time of ways you can test a plant for a virus. Some work, some don't. <clears throat> Usually, the labs that do gross rosette diagnostic work are using something called PCR amplification. It takes a long time, takes a lot of plant material, and you get you have a 50 50 chance of getting it right. Now, because the, we said the virus is hard to see under a microscope, that's one of the reasons why it's hard to get. Hard to get it right. Sometimes you can take the witch's broom, and I've done this from a plant in Nebraska. I cut the witch's broom off of a hedge of bush rose bushes and sent it into a diagnostic lab, and they said this plant does not have rose rosette. I took another piece off the same plant and sent it to a different lab, and they said, oh, yes, it does have rose rosette. So you, you can't really rely yet that what result you get is actually accurate, which is why I say go through the steps, step one, step two, looking at the symptoms, then get a test result and see if it confirms that your plant may have diagnosed, uh, rose, diagnosed rose rosette. Now, why is this doing this? Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is cool. This has come out, this is a project we've been working on this year. Drone identification of sick plants. I said this is not possible, but it does work. Uh, in fact, we're going to see how well it works next month when we have our meeting next month and they're going to report on the tweaking that they've done with this. They can take a drone and fly it over a field. Now, this wouldn't do for you, but it would do for growers and producers. Fly it over a field and the software will identify where the sick plants are and give you the GPS coordinates. Now, here's how it works. The more green you have, the more healthy the plant is. When, the, when it captures the software, when it captures the imaging. 
If the plant's in stress, it's going to produce orange, yellow, or red. No chlorophyll. Not as much chlorophyll, so it's not going to be as healthy. Because you get the GPS coordinate, you, somebody can go out from the producer or the grower to that GPS coordinate and see which plant it is that's sick. So here's what it looks like. This is the 77 acres that they flew over. This area was the hot spot. There was the hot spot down here today, but that was there again. Yeah. This is the one of interest. Uh, blown up, you can see something's really sick through here because we got lots of red. So when they go out into this section, what they find is cases of plants with rust. Mosaic disease, which is a virus, rose rosette, and drainage problems. <laughs> Plants under stress are giving out these color signals. So this is really cool. Now, will it tell us which plant has rose rosette? Not yet. They're working on that to, to give some parameters to the, the identification so they can get some likely targets uh, that will tell them What's got black spot? What's got powdery mildew? What has crown gall, which is hard to find, which is hard to diagnose in the field? And then what, what gets rose rosette? Our task force is doing a lot of things. Uh, our task force is funded by a grant by the Department of Agriculture. The current grant is $4.6 million, so you can do a lot with $4.6 million. But not if you have 37 researchers and universities participating, but we are making huge strides in what we know about this disease and what causes this disease. Maybe who is us? Huh? Who is us? Uh, we it, are doing this. Who is we? Uh, it's a Rose Rosette Task Force. It's 37 okay. universities. Okay, so it's a collective. It's a collective organized by the, under the Department of Agriculture's funding program. Okay. So, uh, we are improving the sensitivity of our of the testing so that it can identify uh, fast, give faster results and more reliable results. Those programs are being done at Texas A&M and Oklahoma State University. We also have people from all over the United States helping us identify roses that are resistant or potentially resistant to rose rosette. We didn't have that last year. We do this year. Um, the participants in the resistance studies, are, some of them are members of the Houston Rose Society. So the other side of the research team, we're looking at how do we diagnose it, we're looking at plants that are potentially resistant. University of uh, Tennessee and the University of Delaware are looking at what carries the disease. The little critter that carries the, the virus from plant to plant. That's, this is Mark Windham, who is heading up the MITE program. This is Ellen Roundy, who is a Houston Rose Society scholarship recipient. She's part of the research team. Uh, so this group is studying what is the best way to manage the MITE in the areas where the mite gets and what can be done to deter mite feeding that might transfer the disease. They are working, the mite group is working with chemical companies to come up with antiviral compounds that can be used to inoculate plants so that if they are coming in contact with rose disease, they throw it off. That is real exciting. We'll know more about that next month. You can't buy these things. Now, there are people, I know this is not a shop, that tell you that they have cures for rose rosette. Those people usually have something to sell. So if somebody tells you they have a cure for rose rosette or they made this up in their kitchen, it don't work. Uh, and, and buyer beware because it don't work. So no matter what you hear, there's not a cure right now for rose rosette. How do you get it? Well, it starts with an infected plant, and this little critter is a wingless mite. All it's got is two little front legs, so all it can do is crawl. Uh, up until last year, we thought there was only one mite that carried <coughs> it. There are actually two in the south. 
Phyllococcus uh, fructophilus, and this one. This one is not known to, to be in Houston. This one will come as far as Houston. So it doesn't answer the question, why don't we have it like North Texas? But we have the potential if we have the mind. Now, the good thing about these mites is on their own, they, they don't get very far because they don't live very long. And they got two teeny tiny legs that you can only see under a microscope. So all they can do is basically get from one leaf and if one leaf is touching another leaf, they crawl onto the other leaf. And that's how they get from plant to plant. But in, in there, they only really go, can go about 30 to 50 yards either by themselves or if they do what's called ballooning. They crawl up to the edge of the leaf and they stand up on their butts and they raise their arms in the air and then when the wind catches them, they float okay. to another plant. And if that's not a rose or a plant that they want to feed on, they get up to the edge of the leaf and they do it again until they find a plant that they can feed on. It's kind of crazy, but that's how it works. Okay. <clears throat> if, if you knock them off the plant, they starve to death in five days. Now, University of Tennessee says they starve to death in one day, but they defer to Dr. Jim Lamarine at the University of West Virginia, who's done mite research forever. And he's, his, in his study, they live for five days without being on a plant. So one to five days, they're going to starve to death. Okay? <clears throat> they can walk from plant to plant. They can balloon and get blown from plant to plant. But if you put a leaf blower behind it, they can go, they can go to Boston and Hatch, Texas from you. <laughs> so if you suspect something's weird, leave that leaf blower in the garage. Uh, they can hitch a ride on, on bugs and birds and even humans. We believe that that's one of the reasons why um, Farmer's Branch got hit pretty hard is because people were working on sick bushes and then they were going and working on healthy bushes and they picked up mites on their clothes or their tools and they were just carrying them along with them because the incidence of symptoms would go from this corner and then in the middle of the street and then down the street and you could see the path of where the workers worked in, in those public places. They can also be transferred by propagation, budding, and grafting. <laughs> Now, we want to fight these mites. Uh, we, the mite is, is, if you don't have the mite, the chances of the disease spreading are very, very slim. So keeping the mite under control is real important. And you're never going to see it. You're just going to see the symptoms. Uh, they hide in really tight little niches, like where the, stem, the leaflet was attached to the stem and underneath the sepals of the buds. Now they can overwinter in the plant. It, the reason that people say that the, the, the symptoms show up in the spring is because when it gets warm enough, the mite comes out of its hiding place and starts to feed. Once they start to feed, then you start to see the symptoms. Because the plant's trying to grow out of being sick. And that's why it gives you weird looking. The mite doesn't give you weird looking stuff. The plant's trying to grow healthy, grow to health, and it's speeding up faster than it can actually do that. So in a whole lifetime, without a leaf blower or any other intervention, they're only going to get about 300 yards from where they started. So University of Tennessee did a test. And they looked at what is unique about Interstate 20. Remember? Above Interstate 20 you had, below you didn't. Well, they took 240 sites from, from the Gulf Coast all the way up to northern Alabama to see where, where was Rose Rosette and what mites inhabited the plants where we found Rose Rosette. So these, all these dots are, are research sites. Unique is, then they went in and said, okay, now where's the mite? What mites do we find in these sites? This is the fructophilus mite. It's lower than where the incident of rose rosette. And the aramis mite, 
is even further south. This is the one that could come down to our neck of the woods. But Rose Rosette's not down here. So the obvious question is, why is Rose Rosette not down here? And the theory at this point, and they need to do more research on this subject, is that down south, as far as we are, neither of these mites like really hot weather, and they don't like wet foliage. And we have both of those things. And so the theory now is we don't have the environmental conditions that would cause us to have incidences of rose rosette like they have further north of us. So we hope that theory holds true. Now, one thing that we do know from the plants that we've tested here in Houston is there's going to be 40 times more mites in that wicked looking piece of plant than in the rest of the bush. So there can be times when you're not really sure and you want to check and you want to make sure you got it before you dig up the plant. And in that case, it would be okay to cut that disease piece of plant out. Because you're just getting rid of the mite factory. If that's where the mites are, if we get rid of that, then we don't have as many mites doing as much, doing as much damage. And, and that's okay until you have time to confirm whether the plant is sick or not, and then take it out if it is. Now, the effect of rose rosette on plants can be one of two things. It can be local or it can be systemic. Uh, for years, people that went through the 1990s outbreak of Rose Rosette, I would hear them say, oh, well, you just cut that stem out that's infected and it'll plan to be okay. And sometimes that's true, but most of the time it wasn't. Most of the time, the next plant, the time that plant got in stress again, the symptoms showed up again, which meant it wasn't local, it was systemic. Local is when the mite that's on a plant, it starts to feed, it feeds for five days. On the fifth day, it transfers the virus to the plant. It's got to manufacture the mocus in its gut before it can inject the mocus into a healthy plant. Now, there's a small window of time that that virus is only in that one stem. We don't have a way to tell because nobody turns the light on when they infect the plant. So we don't know when that happens. So there is a window of time that only that plant is infected. Now, as the mite continues to feed, or as more mites come onto that plant and feed, the infection becomes systemic and goes all the way to the roots. If it's systemic, there's, there's, that plant is not, can't do really anything except take out the bush. Now, I've seen this test negative for rose rosette. I've seen healthy parts of the same bush test positive for rose rosette. So you kind of have to use common sense, go through the steps, and then get, get your theory validated because there's no way you can know if it's local or systemic by looking at the plant. Now, the University of Tennessee shares this, <clears throat> and, and, and I think it's a good idea because if you know at the, as early as possible, that you might have a problem, you can have the opportunity to take action before something happens. Now, this is all one stem on the same plant. This part's healthy, this part has rose rosette. Now, what the signal that this particular stem had rose rosette is the <coughs> number of thorns, and I had somebody bring me a picture that I, uh, a bush that looks like it came from Hades because it has so many thorns, but they don't look like rose rosette thorns. When a plant has rose rosette, it doesn't have big honking spikes like the chestnut rose does. They usually are needle fine and they look like nettles. If, if a rose makes a, a, a thorn every two inches, in a plant with rose rosette, in that two inches you'll have a hundred thorns. So there's not room for them to be very big, and they usually aren't. They usually look like this, just little bitty needly things. 
Um, it's common to see what are called strap leaves. Here's normal leaves, here's really thin, feathery looking leaves. Chili thrips causes that too, folks. Nothing but rose rosette is known to cause the excessive thorniness. Uh, distorted sepals, I don't know that I could look at a healthy plant, especially an old garden rose, uh, and determine from the bud whether it is infected with rose rosette. That's a refined diagnosis. But you can clearly see something's going on with this piece. And so then I would go through the diagnostics and say, okay, what's wrong with this piece? Is it chili thrift? Somebody spray ground up somewhere? And then go from there with, with, with what's going on. Now, we're gonna talk about some symptoms. I got lots of symptoms to show you. Uh, usually symptoms from the infection, initial infection can show up in three weeks to one year after the plant has been infected. Uh, we've said this, plants in, in stress are more prone to get it than plants that are healthy. Uh, it, it, disease uh, accelerates as weather gets hot. That's been true in Dallas. Uh, infected plants usually die in a few years from the time the first symptoms appear because the virus stresses the plant so much that it just it eventually just runs out of energy. And this is true. Susan Kelly and I pruned a Belinda tree that was six foot tall and six foot wide in Farmer's Branch, Texas, for an hour before we realized that plant had rose rosette. And we only found it because we, we drew straws to see who was going to lay on the ground and crawl up underneath the, this bush and get that one stem that was dead, that was up in the interior of the canopy we couldn't reach. And when she laid down on the ground and looked up in the plant, she went, Houston, we have a big problem. And there was a piece of, of plant that had rose rosette in the very center of the plant, up against the main, step, in the main cane and the cane that was dead and wedged in that spot. And we could not see it from the outside. So usually, in all the ones that I've found, except for those ones at the Galleria, the plant has been densely foliated and the, the symptoms were inside the bush. So if you have densely foliated foot, really packed with leaves, look on the inside and make sure you don't have anything messing around. In plants with rose rosette, people say, oh, the stems turn red. What color are stems when they first form? Okay, don't be cutting that mess off. Because I've had people do that this year. Send me the new growth and say, what's wrong with this plant? I said, well, it was the part that was going to have the flower, but now not so much. <laughs> With rose rosette, the stem may not turn ever turn green. I have seen plant witches' brooms that were solid green. So leaf reddening is a, that is a symptom of rose rosette, and stems that don't turn the right color of green is a symptom of rose rosette. <coughs> leaf distortion, you couldn't be more distorted than that little mess. That was the Belinda's dream that we got in Farmer's Branch. Okay? The leaves are going to be feathery, they're going to be tiny, they're all going to be tangled up in a knot. Chili fruit says that too. So, so you have to be careful. It, I've seen herbicide damage over by Mary Fulton's house on Braceboot, on Braceboot, that had plants that had been round up drift got when somebody was cleaning the curb. And they demonstrated symptoms similar to that. Uh, this one is hard to diagnose. Uh, it's called rapid lateral branching. I have a picture just like this. It was taken in farmer's branch. It was chili thrips. So stem grows up. Plant doesn't know what to do. The infection is here, so it just starts shooting out stems in all directions, trying to grow out of the virus. Um, I don't put a lot of stock in this because in the spring you got a lot of plants that do that. Leaf porosis is common. Usually you see this between the witch's broom and the healthy tissue. Um, plants not getting enough, this is part of the plants not getting enough uh, nutrients and so the, the foliage turns yellow. That can also be caused by not enough water in the summer, too much water in the spring, and not enough <coughs> iron in the soil. So you can't rely on that just by itself. Again, this is from plants that we pulled out of uh, Farmer's Branch. Sometimes the cane will be unusually thick. I've seen Rose Society members at a road show create 
stems that are so fat, you, you have a hard time getting them in the base because they pump them with so much fertilizer. So just because the plant has thick canes, especially this time of year, don't get excited about that. <clears throat> yeah, premature bud development. Chili thrips causes this too. Rapid growth starts where the infection occurred. That's less than a quarter of an inch long and it's trying to make a flower. The, you, wouldn't, you would know when you see this that something was wrong. And it just stopped there and you'll figure out what's wrong. Okay? Uh, abnormal leaflets can look like feathers. You can get a piece of a plant and, and all it looks like a big feather duster. Uh, that was a, a rose bush at a hotel in uh, Nebraska. So, nothing but rose rosette causes this. In a plant, in a stem that has rose rosette, you can usually tie it in a knot without breaking it. It is just like rose. I've done it. I did it. I did it here. Uh, <clears throat> this was, was a plant at Iowa State University. Healthy, what's coming up out of the ground? The guy said, oh, well, that's just a basal break. I said, no, it's not a basal break. Watch this. And I tied this piece in a knot. I could put my hands on those thorns, and they didn't stick me because they were just like rubber. They just bent. They didn't come off. They just bent. So only rose rosette does that. No, no other plant disease will do that. Uh, we call this witch's broom. This is what it's been known as since, since rose rosette was first identified. If you're driving down the road and you see this feather duster upside down stuff on a plant on a rose bush, Chances are, you get up close and look at it, you're going to find it. That is the most definitive. Nothing else causes that. Anything to look like that. No other disease, no other bug, no other virus, no other nothing will cause that. That is, that is absolutely definitive for this disease. Sometimes, this was uh, a rose in, in West Virginia, Blenda's dream, that's what Blenda's dream looks like normally. That's Belinda's stream in this plant with rose rosette. And look, a stem is coming out of the middle of the bloom with a bud on it. It's going to make another one. Now that's really weird. But this whole piece of that plant had rose rosette. Excessive thorniness, we've seen that. Uh, that is an example of what we would call the nettle effect. Uh, just hundreds and hundreds of thorns. Only rose rosette does that. And sometimes you can have rose rosette and something else going on at the same time. This was the first diagnosis of rose rosette in Houston. This was at a residence. They had three old garden roses in the front yard that had been there at least seven years. Uh, they had old blush. It had rose rosette. They had either Archduke Charles or Grandmoise Superior. We could never tell from the one bloom that we had, which it was. It had rose rosette. And then we had a mystery rose that was a tea. It did not have rose rosette. And a well-meaning person went in and dug them all up and destroyed them. We would have loved to have the tissue out of that one that did not have rose rosette. But this was old blush. It had rose rosette and powdery milk. It was totally covered in white house from powdery milk. So you can have you can have more than one thing going on. So to prevent, you don't want to have plants so close that the mite can go from one place to the next. Uh, we don't want to use leaf blowers in an area where uh, rose rosette has been diagnosed. The better practice would be to rake and drag and abrade. Uh, it recognize that if you if you work on a suspicious looking plant, probably a good idea to change clothes because you might have be carrying something that you don't want to take home again. Uh, or if a lot of us do community service in gardens, if you do that, then and you come across suspicious looking plants, do the suspicious looking plants today and then go to another garden where there's healthy plants another day. Don't go to a sick garden and a healthy garden on the same day. Um, where rose rosette has been diagnosed, the recommendation is currently to prune heavily in the spring so you get rid of any overwintering mites and apply a dormant old spray in early spring to 
try and reduce any mite populations that you might have. University of Tennessee says if you wait until you've got a witch's broom, you have a bigger problem than you can imagine because other plants are likely uh, to be infected. Dr. Whitman says that when it gets to this point, the food source is getting slim. And so when it gets to this point, people are jumping shift, going to other plants to get, have a bigger food supply. And so he says the mite population, in, when it gets to that stage, it gets hard to control. So the, the goal is to reduce whatever mite populations that might be on a plant or get them out. And how do you get them out? Let me tell you what you don't do. We learned this from the Dallas experience. You don't send somebody in there with a chainsaw and cut a six by six plant off at the base and then drag it through a garden of 500 plants to the garbage dumpster. Because all those mites that were on that bush, you just distributed them all over the place. So the current best management practice is to put a big bag over the plant, tie it off at the bottom, take a saw and saw it off at the bottom. Now all the mites and the infected tissue is in the bag. And then you can do a root system. Um, people say, well, there's not bags that big. Yes, there are. They're called Christmas tree bags. So in areas where uh, I have gone and they've had to take up, take out collections of established roses, we have used Christmas tree bags to do that. You can buy those off the internet at any time of year. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what do you do with the roof? Huh? What do you do with the roof? Send it to the landfill. I would not compost a root system that had possibly had the roof. You should take it out, right? I oh, you absolutely want to take it out. Now, the good news. The, the, the University of uh, Tennessee and, and University of Delaware have been working on mitocides that work to control rose rosette and the mite that carries the rose rosette in places where rose rosette is a rampant problem in Tennessee. It's, it's everywhere. And so we can't get these. These are commercial products. But products containing 5-fenthrin as the active ingredient has been shown to control the mites that carry rose rosette virus. Now the question is, when do you spray and how often do you spray? Because that could be brand dependent and based on the mite studies that have been done, they migrate. The Tulsa Rose Garden spent tens of thousands of dollars on mitocides and every plant in the place had rose rosette when I was there. And the issue was they were spraying when the mite wasn't home. And so the next year, the, the effort was set out traps, let's see what we catch. And once we start seeing mites in these traps, then we start spraying. And they've had a better result uh, since they started doing that. Just going out and randomly spraying, there might not be anything there to spray for. So you kind of have to kind of have to have a sense of what you're working with. Yes. But those products do work on, on the mites. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I had a question about when you were taking the plant out and covered it and mm -hmm. cut it off the roots. Then do you put it in the landfill? The root system? Yeah, I send the whole thing. No, in the plant. Yeah, in the bag, sure. In the bag and you can put it in trash. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Don't want to compost it is the, no, is the point. Right, okay. You want, you want to keep it as far away from you as possible. Now, there are roses that have real sentimental value and it is really hard for people to get rid of those roses. Uh, and I get that. If you have a rose that has sentimental value, you can try to prune out the infected part. For sure, disinfect the equipment that you, root, that you use. For sure, change clothes, take a shower after you finish so you're not passing it around your yard. Uh, but then you need to watch that plant and be ready if those symptoms come back to go to the next level and remove the plant. Because as populations of the mite build up, 
so does your prom. And it's going to be, it might be a while before you can see it. So you can try, and I have seen some statistics that say 40% of the time you might be successful. Uh, but just be vigilant and watch and make sure that you don't see it come back. Now, you need to be cautious of claims about plants that are allegedly resistant to rose rosette. This came out last week. This rose was in the rose resistant study. In 2017, it got rose rosette disease in all of the plots at University of Tennessee and University of Delaware. So be careful when people tell you that something kills the, the virus or that a plant is resistant. Do a little more research because there's not very many plants that are resistant. Now, there are, the good news is there are some that try as they might, the researchers have not been able to force the plant to get rose rosette. So for those of you in here that are breeders and dabble in creating new roses, there's a handout for you that has all of these varieties on it. Uh, bright eyes, you're going to start seeing that down here more. Uh, it's climbing rose. It was created by the guy that created Knockout. Laughter is an old fragrant hybrid tea. It is a coral, pink coral bloom that's pretty big with a yellow center, so it opens nice and it's fragrant. It's tall, probably five feet tall and probably 30 inches wide. Uh, Basie's purple. I have only seen that available at the Antique Rose Emporium. It is a beautiful wine colored. Uh, shrub rose, Tim, do you grow that? Okay. It, it's used by a lot of breeders because it has a unique number of chromosomes. Uh, Little Buckaroo is a miniature. I can't remember who, who put that one on the market. We don't have much uh, experience out here with Ragosa roses. Ragosa roses are usually something that is grown up in Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota where it's really cold. But this particular uh, Ragosa rose, I have seen this grow in Louisiana, so it's not that far from, that's not that far from Houston. Um, Sunny Knockout has proven to be resistant. Uh, excuse me, can we go back one slide here? Uh, the one on top is F-R-A-U, Frau. Okay. Lady Okay. Uh, the hybrid tea, the Cortez hybrid tea winter sun has a five inch bloom, li uh, lemon cake mix yellow, uh, very fragrant. They couldn't make it get rose rosette. Uh, we do see this particular Rugosa rose down here quite a bit, Hansa. And this rose is in the rose research, uh, the Rose Rosette trial in Tyler, and I would have never guessed that this rose that I have seen at the Lindell Park Rose Garden in Minnesota could stand <coughs> temperatures 100 or more degrees in climate in a place where there is no supplemental irrigation, but it was doing fine. So this one is, is one to watch among the Ragosa family of roses because I've seen what it can do in both climates. And then we think the theory, and this theory has is, is been put out there by Houston Rose Society member, Dr. David Slezak, University of Minnesota, that these are the parents of the rose resistance in roses. Uh, these are species roses, and David has done a lot of breeding work with Satigera, and the Rosa Palustris, in the wild, people have actually gone into swamps in all over the United States looking for roses in places where there's Rosa multiflora, which gets Rose rosette at the drop of a hat, and they will find Rosa multiflora infected with Rose rosette, and this rose will be right next to it and not. So these two, the theory is, is, is some of this resistance to Rose rosette is coming from these two varieties. Now, final word. You go home for with any with.
with any message is don't panic. That's what happens everywhere. All these 11 people that have called me from Jack since January, is they panic. I need you to come right now. I said, I run a law firm. I can't come right now. No, I need you to come right now. I'll pay you to come right now. <laughs> I said, send me a picture. That's not Rose Rosette. I'll come on Saturday. Uh, really? Really? I don't have to dig it up. I'm like, don't do nothing until we know for sure what you have. So don't overreact. If you get it, it's not the end of the world. It might be the end of that plan, but it is not going to be the end of the world. If you live in and around Houston hotspots, be vigilant. Be watching. Watch your neighborhood. If you've got roses planted in the median, pay some attention to them when you turn the corner and make sure that you don't see anything that's odd. If it's odd, or if it's at your neighbor's house and you don't want to be the bad guy, call me. I'll be the bad guy. In a nice way, but let them know what's going on. I have stuff you can give your neighbor, just slip it in their mailbox. Uh, it's good to obtain plants from sources that you know where the plant came from. It's, I always am afraid of plant swaps sometimes. Because you don't know what that plant you might be going home with is been exposed to. So just be cautious. If you bring in new plants, it's always a good idea to leave them in that pot or put them in a, an area by themselves and watch them for a little while and make sure everything's coming out like it's supposed to come out. But for sure, get a second opinion. This stuff looks like so many other things that we have down here and 11 times this year, it's, already, it's always been the other things. So if, if you think something is going on, email me a picture. Close up and from a distance. And, and we'll see if we can help you as will all the Houston Road Society Consulting and Master Groups areas. We're happy to help you figure out if you have something you need to do something about or it's just normal plant growth. And I can't tell you how many times it's just normal plant growth. So don't be free. Be smart. So when you say do a test, what do you mean? How do you do a test for those of you? Uh, you tell me. We confirm that you probably have it and I send you the forms to send it into one of two labs. Okay. A lab that I know gives a, result, a reliable test result. And that would be either Texas A&M or Oklahoma State University. Because both of those universities are on the same uh, Rosewood's at task force. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I guess this is not like chili thrips. It does not spread to other plants. It does spread to other plants. It is very contagious. I mean other plants other than roses. No, no. You mean yeah, will, will it so will affect any other roses in your, in your plant you garden up? Okay. It's only for roses. Yeah. The other plants get other things. Yeah, but, like but rose rosette only affects roses. Yes, sir. So if you do have one, do you have to burn the roses? Uh, I have never lit a fire in my backyard and put anything combustible in it because first of all I don't want to talk to those guys that charge you $420 for a possum arm and there is some evidence that if when you put the plant in the fire the heat blows the mites a greater distance than what you would want that to happen. Will the mites stay in the soil? No, they die in one to five days. So, all, when, if you're digging up the roots, you just need to dig up the root ball. You don't have to excavate, you know, a, a plot of, of dirt because after one to five days, they're not going to be there anymore. Well, there's more about uh, composting. If they die within five days. But you have plant matter that has virus that is virus infected in your compost pile. How long will the virus live? I don't know of anybody that's done that study. Yes, ma'am. You know, the Dallas Rose Society had that very question, and they wrote a position paper for the city of Dallas. And the theory 
is once you put that plant in the black plastic bag and it's summer, everything live is going to be dead within a day or two. And so the recommendation, I, and I, you can look, you can Google this Rose Rosette and Dallas Rose Society and get this, but I think the recommendation was like three days. Bag it up, let it sit three days, and then send it on. But, but the city, nor the municipality said, we're not going to take plants and check it for a set. So I, I, don't think that's a, I don't think that's a concern at, at the municipal level. Okay. Yes, sir. Is, is this definitely damaging people that want to grow roses? No. Sure, they can't get them. Well, I don't know, but it would hurt the growing of roses over the long haul of people being. If, if we don't have a better way to diagnose it and keep it out of the chain of commerce, it could have an impact on the industry. Yeah. I mean, we already see it having an impact in North Texas because fewer places want to carry the plants. And homeowners are not saying we're not going to plant them because they're coming down here to buy them or they're going to Mark Shambly's and buy them in buses sometimes. So the, the rose growing public is not as effective. It's just harder to get the varieties you want when you want them. But the supply is what's going to get effective. How, how, how many bushes do you see now in a Home Depot? Not very many. They, they used to sell 300,000 in the South. Ever January to the January to March. But I uh, saw about 3,000 birds on the ground in Congo and they were beautiful. Oh. No evidence at all. So, yeah, I think that's where homeowners are going to see it. It's just, it's, you're going to see it in the supply. The, the industry fears that people aren't going to buy the plants, and so they don't bring in as many plants. And we have to be smart and say, we want the plants, you know. I'm thinking of the potential, you know, young people that are starting to gardens and stuff, and they see this in the newspapers and stuff, they say, well, I don't want to be involved in that. Uh, uh, the, the general public? Right. Uh, I mean, the like like everybody product. else, like everybody in this room, everybody's heard of it. Not very many people know about it. It's up to us to help educate people about what it is. There, there's no bigger truth than if we were going to have it, like Dallas and North Texas had it, we would have done it. There has to be a good, solid scientific reason that we don't see that. That's true for Shreveport, Louisiana has only had a few incidents diagnosed, confirmed incidences of rose rosette, and only in the last two years. Mostly in Mosier City. Yeah. Except that we do have it scattered around Houston. I live in Mosier Memorial City. Well, we have it in two zip codes. We have it in two zip codes so far. But are those um, commercial plantings? Like no, not, not necessarily. If you've got the gallery, that's a commercial planting. You've got Memorial City, that's commercial planting. I don't know who maintains the, the right of ways along Chimney Rock. If that was a homeowners association, no one's ever been able to figure out how those, where those bushes came from or whether or not anybody ever does anything with them from the looks of the bushes. I would say that's not happening. Some, some wonderful soul just planted them and then let them go. Uh, the, the managed planting that was at the apartment complex, that was a managed planting, and the planting at the home, where it had the three old garden roses, that was a managed plant. So it's showing up in, in various kinds of places. Yes, sir? Does anybody sequence the rose rosette virus specifically? Yes. Or do they use the generic virus template? No, um, the first sequencing of the virus occurred in 1984 at the University of Arkansas and the scientist that did that is part of our Rose Rosette Task Force. They have now taken that work further and they have identified some markers in, in the sequencing and, and just for everybody else's understanding, 
uh, a marker is, is a generic signpost. And it says, I'm the virus and I'm on this chromosome in this cell. And so there has been work, and more of that will be reported next month, uh, that sequencing work to, to look at where in these plants that were resistant to rose rosette, what's different genetically from those than plants that get rose rosette. And one of the interesting topics that we will discuss, and you're going to see a piece of in the newsletter about this in a couple of months, is they have found in doing this work, there has been a discovery of something called fungal endophytes. It's good fungus. And we don't realize that fungus can be good, but plants have more good funguses than they have bad funguses. And the good funguses are eating the bad funguses, which is cool because some of these endophytes will devour a virus. And so one of the topics at our meeting in April is going to be exploiting that research on fungal endophytes to see E N D O P H Y T E, exploiting that fact that there are some that will get the viruses, and what can we do to implement that in our rose from that research? Because there are so, all sorts in, in animal work, there are all sorts of fluorescent biomarkers that you can attach to a sequence segment, and uh, I'm sure that they're doing the same thing. But to do that, you have to have the complete sequence of right. specifically of that virus. That right. Yeah. And and I hope that, that we're gonna have some a lot of good information. So y'all will see that the results of this meeting next month and the update on Rose Rosette. Y'all will see that in, up, in upcoming issues of of the newsletter. We will share whatever we learn in in College Station next month with the group.